destroy Otto, the world. No, no, no. It's like Babu. Yes, <laughs> get out of there. Like no, I don't want to. If this is my house, Come these here. are my rules. We have a cool backdrop for now. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Soon Rips there won't in. be. <laughs> should we do about Babu? You yes, should do whatever song. he says. This is his house after all. He will show you the beauty of the house is immeasurable. It's kindness and <laughs> That's right. That's what he's saying in cat. Okay. Are we clicking now? Is that what's happening? Oh, it's tap dancing. Oh. Welcome to Dog Eared Discourse, nerdy little double date, where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Every month, we're pulling a new and exciting book from our shelf. We've broken them down so you can buddy read with us, or just hang out while we discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading Paranasi by Susanna Clark. Danny, can you give us a 60-second recap of where we left off? All right. Uh, one. Ready with the timer? Three. Two, one, go. All right, so we read the last half of this book, and Paranese is figuring out who he really is, and it's not who he thinks that he is. Some new people who are alive enter the house and learn about its beauty, and one of his only friends doesn't quite betray him, but almost. 30 seconds does things take a turn for the worst somehow he overcomes 15. it and he makes new actual friends and uh he learns about Five. where he came from and he is somewhat okay with it and one minute okay he survived <laughs> thanks danny Yay. you did it good job Woo. that's always the scariest part because we decide about Two minutes before the episode starts, who's going to do the 60-second recap? And that is not a lot of time to prepare. So, uh, you nailed it. Let's do an intro. So, I was just talking. My name is Danny. And this is Juan. And I'm Chris. And I'm Kelly, your host today. So, every episode, we pair the half of the book that we just finished with a delicious beverage. And today, we are doing 16's Question. As we talk today, I'm sure you'll figure out what this question actually was. But for people who are avoiding spoilers on our social media, we are not going to tell you what that question is in the drink name. This is a really pretty drink. And when we post this online, you need to take a look at it. It is stunning. It's my favorite color. I like how it changes color, too. Yeah, so... I am a big fan of gradients. We <laughs> Especially gray ones. Gradients. So for this beverage, you coat the glass in absinthe, which gives it a little extra spicy danger element. And then you're going to shake together equal parts of Lillet Blanc, which is a kind of wine-based liqueur, orange liqueur, aka triple sec, and lemon juice. And yes, those are all equal parts. Shake, shake, shake with some ice, pour it into your cocktail glass, and you're going to get this cloudy, grayish kind of like you're in a world where nothing means anything and everything is a little unfamiliar and hard to understand. And then right before you drink it, drop in the same amount as everything else. Like if you did one ounce for everything, you're going to add one ounce of this of Empress Gin. And that's going to bring a sudden burst of color to this otherwise kind of drab and gray and spooky drink. And it turns it into something absolutely beautiful. And that is the answer to 16's question. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. At the end of last episode, we made predictions of what we thought was going to happen in this half of the book. Chris, what was your prediction? I think my prediction was that he was going to stay in the house. Um, I don't really remember my prediction from a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, but I did make an accurate prediction that the house is where things that are forgotten go. And it's specifically called out in in the last mm -hmm. half of the book. So. so you were half right. Yes, I was half right. He does not stay there. He might go back, but he does not stay there. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, the house is what it was. Good job. Juan. Juan. What was First your prediction? All, I have no clue what it was. <laughs> but I will tell you that. Just from reading this portion of it, I don't think that my prediction would have been correct because there was a few things that uh, kind of came as a surprise. Danny. Danny. I was 100% right. 
You guys can all cheer for me. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> In your face. <laughs> so what was your prediction and what did that you That he know? was going to leave. I, I'm really happy with winning. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. And that I was sure. right. <laughs> sure. And Kelly. Your gold trophy is in the mail. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my prediction was that the girl who could travel back and forth at will was going to come and find him. And I did not think that the prophet was on sales. And I thought that he was going to get out of the house. I was wrong. You were except, almost. Except he did get out. Spoilers. Spoilers. Oh, hey, everybody. <laughs> we are going to spoil the heck out of the ending of this book. So if you want to leave, it's too late. <laughs> You're stuck here forever. Uh, we already <laughs> told you. So the book really starts off with him questioning who he is, right? The, or where we left off. We, we started with part four. And he starts off questioning who he was. And like really starting to put it together what's so crazy is that he found his notebook that had all the pages torn out and refused to believe for a significant amount of time even the second half of the book that he's the one that did it yeah right. he didn't like realize that that was him but at the same time he knows in his mind it's just me and the other yeah it's just my and he still was like but it wasn't me though the symbology of putting those pieces together of the ripped up letter as he's sort of putting the pieces of himself together. Right. And the interesting okay. thing is he put together like one page. Yeah. And then he was like, nah, I'm not going to do the rest of it and put the rest in an envelope and, and like pissed off for a little while. And then eventually came back to those and started putting it together. And then it's just this whole snowball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had to work himself up to it. Cause I think it was just too shocking for him. Yeah. A bit of a paradigm shift for him. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like confronting your trauma. Yeah. And like in a big way. Well, it's a little terrifying though, too, because he's gone for years, like at least five or six years of being by himself. He's got his little routine. He goes and sees the other once or twice a week. And then all of a sudden in the last week or so, maybe month, he's run into multiple new people. He's heard new knowledge of other people it's not just him and the other and the dead people in the house it's also all these other people which he has specifically written down all these information about them and he has no recollection of it so it's just this whole like wave of knowledge coming at him and he has to find some way of figuring it out and he's really not given any time to do that he just has to deal with it deal with it deal with it deal with it yeah because everything's happening real fast and then at the same time, his friend, the other, is constantly warning him about number 16. And I had wrote down something that he had said. So the other tells um, Piranesi, his manners will be friendly and insinuating. That is how he intends to destroy you. So the other is trying to convince Piranesi that this number 16 person that's going to show up is a really bad idea and he's like trying to get Piranesi to stay away from him that he's going to destroy them and also from the descriptions that happen of number 16 it is completely opposite from what the warning is about from the other to Piranesi then the other when he like confronts him about it gaslit the hell out of Piranesi hmm. he well before we go into that can you tell us a little bit about 16 oh like, yeah how did I we find out about 16 <laughs> um Let's so hear it um Piranesi is wandering around like he usually does and he gets a whiff of lemon perfume and he's like what is this and he he remembers the way that the other smells he knows that the other wears a cologne and he knows that um when he met the prophet that he also had a cologne smell so this was pretty strong in his mind that it was like an experience because it's like he only smells fish in the sea every day <laughs> like so he got this whiff of lemon perfume and he knew what it was like he knew it was a perfume and then he starts to piece together these other new additions to the house so one of them was bright yellow chalk that was marked on doorways or like walls and stuff but it was also shorter than him 
And then his handwriting was very pleasing to look at. Like this was how he described these events. Already, I was kind of thinking that 16 was a woman just because of the term, the perfume, pleasing handwriting, shorter than he was. Like I was already thinking that this was a female anyways. And, and I was probably thinking- And she yelled at birds. Yeah, and then- <laughs> Then she yelled at birds. And he's like, oh my God, holy shit, that's it's a, a female. Girl. <laughs> it's a girl. And he was pissed. He goes to the other and he like runs, he like walks up to him all angry. And he's like, you lied to me. Why did, would you like, lie to me? I have never lied to you. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, she's a, 16 is a woman. And that's when the other's like, nah, I didn't say that. I never said I mean, said I didn't say it. I didn't say she wasn't a woman. Yeah. So it's not really lying. He's like, I've been referring to her as a he and you never corrected me. And, and then he's like, like, well, you know what? You're a romantic. So if you knew it was a woman, you would have just lost your mind and forgotten about the cause that we're trying to do. So really, it's your fault. And Paranese ends up apologizing to him because the other sucks. Because the other <laughs> is very, very good at gaslighting people. Yeah. That's basically how he made his whole career. Yeah, he just yeah. tricks people into doing stuff and Sucking takes no ownership in. over the hard parts. Yeah. And that was one thing, actually, that I was thinking of was whether he knew that this would be the eventual outcome that he would have like a... I don't, I don't know if the house has like a calming effect on people and just kind of soothes them into this, uh, into this state where they are easy to manipulate in other words, is is he the first person he's done this to? And does everybody, does he know, like, I have to wait a certain amount of time and then eventually I'll get this person, somebody who's completely forgiving and just... Mm. So that's a really good question on yeah. whether or not the house is the one doing this to Paranese. Because one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading it is one of the ways that um, people cope with trauma is sometimes to forget that it's happening and if you have this kind of trauma where all of a sudden you are one you're going through isolation right so it's like you're being isolated from everyone and everything mm -hmm. for a long period of time and then basically your only contact is your captor then is this his way of releasing himself because he doesn't forget who he is completely he understands who he is at a fundamental level later on in the book to me it was like it stripped away all of this life experience but left the colonel whatever was him his personality that stayed the same so his inquisitiveness his, his journal, logical thought patterns yeah his, his journaling. journaling so there's yeah. like this core of who he is that is maintained but everything else is slowly stripped away i guess that was my assessment of the house i think chris to to what you were saying earlier was is he coping is this something, in other words, that's happening within him or is this something like as a consequence of being in this house that that will happen to everyone? Eventually, you just become this blissful ignoramus. Well, um, that's the thing is I, I would need to go back and look at it. But how did the other guy react? The guy who came back from the house, he went and like was among statues and stuff because yeah. that's where he liked to be. But could he remember himself? How long did he spend there? And now we we find out later that he couldn't have even fed himself so he wasn't there for very long yeah so maybe he wasn't there long enough at the very least he had somebody checking in on him so we don't know how long he was there necessarily but he did have constant human contact well right. someone could have been leaving him food like we read in piranesi's journal at the beginning where he would go to this one statue and there would always be food there so there not necessarily could there have been human contact it was just he was always provided for whereas mm -hmm. piranesi just kind of learned how to take care of himself so probably either out of necessity because the other was not very good to him or he just preferred it that way and it gave him like a purpose for living in the house so the other wanted him to forget who he was and just start over as this caveman-esque type person that was my other point with it was the childlike nature where it sort of starts stripping away like you said the traumas and all this learned and gained experience through life where you're just left with this childlike wonder of everything around you and you don't even question whether there is you know these motivations that are hidden from you you just kind of take it at face value so that that makes me think that it is partly the house and partly yeah. the trauma because the house itself because how do you get there how do you get there the ritual mm. right so um i guess this is a good transition to talk about the ritual and how we get there how about this for a transition going back to what you guys were saying about the trauma the way that paranesi 
gets introduced to the other in the real world before he gets sucked into the house was that he went over to him to interview him about a book that he was writing for Arne's sales. He's the main occultist guy that everybody follows. He was who worked at the university and was writing all these books and taught people how to transcend to this Exactly. House. And we've actually made contact with him in the first half of this book. He called him the prophet and he kind of just wandered into Peronisi's life, spilled some truth and just walked out. He and the other do not get along. And we find out through this interview that Peronisi, before he gets in there, has with Kitterly, who is the other, there actually is a way to the magical realm that everybody has been assuming is fake. As he's kind of explaining this to the other to Paranese, he's like, wait, does anybody know you're here? That was so crazy when I saw that. I was like, red flags, yes, red flags. Have you told anyone? Yeah. You're yeah. Have you told anybody what you're working on or why you might be here or anything like that? No. Awesome. Want to see a cool ritual? <laughs> and Paranese, being the inquisitive scientific type, was like, hell yeah. I don't really believe in this anyway, so he, he, why not? He started off a little bit hesitant, and then he's like, oh, it's only going to take 12 minutes? Oh, sure. And he didn't believe in it. Apparently, you don't have to believe in this stuff to, in order for the ritual to work. That's yeah. It just works. Hence why he kidnapped people. So then he gets flipped away into this magical labyrinth, and he's been there ever since. So apparently, he remembers this interaction with Ketterly, or the other, um, because he remembers that he went to Battersea when he was reading his ripped up journals, entries that he put together, and he was like, Battersea, wow. In the first half of the book, when the other had mentioned that word, I thought it was nonsense, and I had told him that, and I said, you're just testing me, like you're faking testing me so that, you know, because I, I really know everything. Visible relief on the other's part, like, oh, thank God, you don't remember that. Yeah, Woo. but actually <laughs> that was where Ketterly lived, somewhere near... Battersea Park, and that was where his house was. So that he can, he's like, oh, I'll just wander over there to go interview him about his expertise with this other dude and all of his books and stuff. And so he's reading his journal entries, and he's like, "Holy shit, <laughs> Battersea! Wow, well, yeah. I remember now." And it did all stem from the question that sixteen asked, right? She asked in pebbles. Oh this, yeah, we missed the that question, part. Yeah. Right? What was the question? And the question was, are you Matthew Rose Sorison? And he sees those words and he has like a record scratch. His whole like life flashes before his eyes. He gets dizzy. And then, oh, yeah. and then he like blinks and it goes away. He's like, I don't know why that name means something to me, but it does. Right. And so he goes to put back all the pages together and he starts reading about this interview that he went to and he tore those pages out and this is why i think that it's partly him coping with trauma because he's the one that tore them out so yeah it's and it it tore out everything that dealt with his name it tore, tore out everything that dealt with this particular interview and i think it was a survival instinct and the house was more than willing to help him cope and so it might have been he wanted to forget he wanted these things out of him, and this is the house of forgetting. So mm. if he wanted to remember, like he wants to remember where all the rooms are, and he can go 900 rooms this way and 800 rooms that way, and he can recite all of the different things. So all that memory he has on the tip of his tongue at all times. And so this, because he wants to remember it, but anything he wants to forget and not have that trauma relived the, the house is more than willing to accommodate. That's interesting. I definitely didn't see that when I was reading, but it makes a lot of sense now that you say that. So this ritual, I liked this ritual. It felt very Call of cthulhu -y. First, Arnis had to get a skull from somebody who lived back when the wonder of the world wasn't destroyed. And that's to bring back the idea that we can communicate with the world. So... This was back in part one. They described that part of it. But now there's this new ritual. The essence of it is that he's bringing about the wonder of the world and someone can guide you to certain realms. And it says very specifically that Arnis wanted to only go to the realm where things were forgotten. If there's other worlds. This is the one his goal was. Was that because he was trying to find the secret knowledge? He was trying to find the secret oh, knowledge, okay. which has been forgotten by mankind. And so he's traveling 
to this one world. But that was Arnas, and now Ketterly believes in him, the other. So that was the prophet is Arnas, and Ketterly is the other. And Ketterly wants this knowledge so bad that he's sending other people to this forgotten world, which makes me think that there's other worlds. And this whole book reminded me very much of a Call of Cthulhu madness Mm. scheme. And to get these bones... He literally had his followers pick it outside of a history museum, break in, and then for some reason, he promptly forgot that he was even fighting the history museum for these pieces. And he was like, oh, never mind. I don't need them. But it's because he stole them. found wax on the floor. (laughs) He stole them. (laughs) Which is pretty baller. If you really wanted to, like, find a whole new world and the only way to do it was to get some bones from a museum, like... And they're like, you want to do what with it? (laughs) Uh... Ritual. (laughs) Stealing from a museum seems like equally the easiest and hardest thing. Like I could see somebody just going in and opening a drawer and be like, no, this is mine now. But also I could see somebody going in there trying to open a drawer and then the walls just burst open with armed security. Oh my gosh. All of the like the metal siding comes down on every single wall. Trap door opens beneath you. (laughs) And now you're part of the exhibit. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Cut to them fluffing up your hair before they pose you to oh my gosh. oh my as gosh. a caveman or something. Oh no! I was thinking there's a chocolate shop near my house that has like a cute little Uh-oh. chocolate shop at top, and um, yikes, what's going on? With that? And they make chocolate on in the basement, and but the floor of the chocolate shop is glass, so you can look down and watch them make it. So you could put the would be thief in the bottom and do gladiator fights with them if you wanted to <laughs> historical <laughs> enactment <laughs> and people could watch from above are we talking like the rancor pit here yeah the exactly rancor pit of chocolate i i thought you were going with a sweeney todd angle but except <laughs> yeah. chocolate. Oh. you become the chocolate candy yeah. oh. sold above this is how willy wonka this is, this is actually how the, the <laughs> natural history museums get all their bodies yeah yeah all yeah. natural baby oh god Actually, I'm gonna need one of, five guys to turn into an elephant. One of one in my first dates was actually at the Bodies Museum in Seattle or exhibit in Seattle because I was um, taking um, anatomy and physiology at the time. So I went there with my notes and I went there for school. Okay, I was studying, and then Juan rolls up and he's like, "Hey, I got these he- a headset, but we have to share." Oh, <laughs> he's very like, smooth. "I'll help you also study very budget conscious the body." Because they rented each one individually. Juan's <laughs> <laughs> uh, no fir- sucker. At yeah. first, it was you know, it's like, oh, this is a, a good, going on a date and. I it was, was not around. a date at first. He turned it into one, but then again, I was like, "Wow, I mean, only you, you could... would stare at dead bodies with me." <laughs> I mean, if you can turn in lovers. a bunch of corpses into a date, I mean, more power to you, dude. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Good job. <laughs> um, okay, so back to our uh, book in oh, yeah. hand. Um, they said that the the way the ancients perceived the world was the way the world truly was, and that's what everybody fell behind and was like. Hell yeah, this is why the Arn Sales guy is so cool, because he gets it. Oh. But it turns out that's why the labyrinth is the way it is, because it has, like, spirit of the ancients in it. Ooh, let's talk about Arn Sales. When Paranasi was putting back together his notes, or rather Matthew was putting back together his notes, it talks a lot about Arnie. I'm just going to call him Arnie, because I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. We're on something. board. He's so, hip with it. So... <laughs> <laughs> He basically goes through, and he's a cult leader through and through. Like, he is a solid, dyed-in-the-wool cult leader. And he knows how to manipulate anybody. So, like, one of the things he does is with that um, girl, Sylvia. Sylvie. With Sylvie, Arnie goes and basically tells her to pick a fight with her family and break off all connection. And her family wasn't even questioning anything. He just wanted to make sure he could. Yep. And that's the sign He gained of, nothing from it. Yeah, he gained yeah. absolutely nothing from it. They didn't suspect anything. They didn't think she was in trouble. He just wanted her to pick a fight with the family and separate her. So that's like, ooh. Yeah, I still got it. He just <laughs> walks away. Yeah, he's like, yeah, she's mine now. Yeah. And that was real creepy. That was a straight up cult. The problem was there was the cult was grounded in not really reality, but in kind logic. of truth. Yeah, the, truth. Uh, yeah, the the aspect of him 
wanting people, logical people to come and argue with him just so that he could dismantle their arguments. Whether it was fact or not, he used his logic did not falter, I guess. Is, right. Yeah. And then the fact that he actually, the ritual actually worked kind of frustrates me because then it's like, oh, well, maybe some other cultists are actually working right now too. Yeah. Yeah, about this. And if this wild thing, this tenet of his cult is real, then you kind of have to buy, like, all right, I guess I will go also start a fight with my family. Yeah. And like, especially if you've seen the other worlds and stuff like that. It's She had video evidence of other worlds mm-hmm. and people just didn't believe her. It sounds like she was kind of a weirdo too. So she probably didn't get the chance to show it to terribly many people. It sounded like it was kind of a, dare I say, cult classic. (laughs) (laughs) One thing that was interesting was how quickly Arnie, at least in my uh, perception of it, he just showed Raphael. Like, oh, you want to see? I'll show you. Almost knowing that no one would believe he knows human nature so well that he knows what he can get away with for example taking a cop yeah he's like i'll show you because he knows that no one's going to believe you yeah and luckily she was recording it because then she could show it to matthew and then matthew can transgress between worlds yeah i was a little curious as to why he would even tell her that though and i think that the conclusion that i came to was that he and kitterly the prophet and the other were so at odds with each other like they their beliefs were pretty similar but they just seemed like they have a personality conflict that they couldn't get over because they both want to be alpha dogs Mm -hmm. cannot roll my eyes hard enough but (laughs) i think that his whole motivation for just wandering into the house and telling piranesi everything and then immediately snitching on the other with by telling the cops exactly where he's at he must have like just gotten out of prison was like, you know what, fuck this guy. And just like blew up the whole whole organization. So really he won again <laughs> and continues to hold the upper hand over Kitterly. There's a point where Kitterly slash the other knows that 16 is in the house and he's looking for her and he's wearing jeans, which is unheard of for this guy. And like going up and down the hallways with a flashlight and he's just like, over here, over here, over here, over here, over here, just like looking everywhere and it's all frenzied and scattered and like a little stressful. Then 16 walks by and has just this cool, calm looking over here, looking over here, and kind of more calculated and thoughtful approach to finding whatever she's trying to find. And I think that that's kind of a pretty good comparison as to what was happening with Kitterly and everybody. He's just everywhere. He doesn't have a set idea of what his goal is because even with the finding the knowledge, one day he wanted to do that, one day he wanted to do something else, one day he wanted to do something else. We never stuck with that thread for any amount of time. I think he's kind of panicking because like this is not his original idea. Arnie, our man, he was the one who brought him to the light, if you will. And so now that Arnie is now taking a step back, well, one, because he was in prison, but (laughs) but also after that, and he's just kind of like laying low now. And then the other is like, you know what? Now this is my time to shine. Like, I'm going to take all the glory once I find the secret knowledge. And when Matthew showed up on his doorstep, he was saying, a young, healthy man is just what I wanted. And he ended up making him a slave to collect information about the house because he was busy and also worried that he was going to go mad. He didn't give a shit about this guy. And then also Arnie didn't really care either because he's probably done the same thing for multiple other people. And that was something that to me really showed the difference between those two. The confidence that Arnie has, he will manipulate you to your face and doesn't have to hide it. He's gotten so confident and cocky in his abilities that he will literally just point blank tell you his plan and you sort of fall right into his he seems like the kind of guy that present day would just flap his cape when he's done talking to you and just walk (laughs) away and you're like wouldn't even question it you're like okay you remind me of uh have you seen the movie nightcrawler I don't Ooh. think so. I th- yeah, Night- With Jake Gyllenhaal? Yeah. The Jake Gyllenhaal character from Nightcrawler is who I vi- envision Arnie as. This super cocky, super arrogant, and will tell you how it is and blather. Like, he just 
is is a way of getting into your head through just a sheer force of words and also doesn't care does not care about anything yeah his focus is so singular and whatever it is that he's after where you see ketterly is power hungry but he does not have his own agenda or he does not have individual means for achieving that in other words he sees how other someone else is looking for this power and he can intercept that but he would not be able to device a way for he for he himself to attain that power right like coattail writing Mm -hmm. yeah he's he's kind of grasping at straws a little bit like okay i think it's over here i i'm gonna try and get it and but he also got a complete disregard for human life and was like all right well let's kill a bunch of people to get there yeah it's just like spy versus spy but instead it's psychopath versus psychopath (laughs) yeah it's like who's gonna win matt it turns out matthew rose Sorensen ends up winning yep yeah Round of applause for Sorensen. One thing that I found interesting, too, was as all of this is unfolding, where 16 has arrived, we know she's a girl, the other is looking for her, Prophet is an entity, but has already said he's not coming physically back. Matthew's just kind of like looking around the room, being like, I don't know which one of you to believe right now. While all of this is happening, we are also very aware that in a very short amount of time, the now four tides are going to all converge. I don't know where the fourth tide came in, but I have a suspicion that the tides are actually a crashing of personalities. So in the first half, we have the joining of the three tides, which by now, I didn't at the time, but by now I think is the other, the prophet, and Piranesi. And now we've got a flood of four tides because 16 has entered the party all converge at pretty much the peak of, in my opinion, the peak of this part of the book where there's a face-off between the other and 16. I think that one of the tides got replaced. If we're going with that analogy, I agree with it for the first three tides, but for the four tides, I believe it's Matthew, Paranese, the other, and 16. I believe that two of the tides are the clash of Paranese and Matthew. Oh, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Because there are two completely separate people. Paranasi acknowledges it, that Matthew is inside of me, but he is asleep. Mm -hmm. And he at one point has to calm him and put him down. So I like your analogy, though, of the four tides and a clashing thereof. But I I really think that it's Paranasi and uh, Matthew are having a conflict. And, And it's just more of a joining and flooding of of this area. So this entire time... Piranesi, even though he's learning that he is Matthew, but he does believe that it's Matthew that's just a part of him that's asleep. During the conflict, Piranesi still is a child of the house, and that is how he views himself. And so even though he is getting shot at by the other, and he still oddly is trying to save the other from drowning, because the other was his friend at one point, and he just cannot accept, I guess he just doesn't even care that the other is trying to kill them at this point, shooting at him or at them with a gun. So he's trying to save the other. Then the waves are crashing and they're, he kind of described the waves catching the edges of the walls and the, the statues. And he says, the spray caught the sun. It was as if somebody had suddenly thrown a hundred barrelfuls of diamonds in the halls. Even though all this horrible stuff is happening, he still views the other as his friend. He still views this crashing waves that could potentially drown his friend as beautiful because he believes that the house is almighty and it's just everything that happens in this house is beautiful and for a reason. And in that vein, I actually, one thing that I, reflecting on this idea of reverting back to childhood in the house kind of makes me think of our memories of childhood that, you know, you are who you are now. You're a, you're an adult and you think back to your childhood and that is a different person, you know, and, and we can all remember childhood and then we can remember adulthood, but I don't remember the in-between even though it is a gradual transition over years, I don't remember when I went from being like a child. 10 to 15 is like, n- there's no recollection there. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it's like, it, it, when you're living through it, it's 
this gradual transition, but looking back at it now, there is no gray. It is just one minute I was a child and lived my life like I, like if I maybe if I jump off of something high enough and flap my arms hard enough, I may be able to fly mm-hmm. to absolutely not because <laughs> yeah. there is there is these things called physics. Mm-hmm. And if you do some maths, you'll figure out that you can. not And it does seem like you're almost living someone else's memories. And that's sort of what I viewed Paranasi remembering Matthew, that it's it's just happened again as an adult and having an adult brain that he's not remembering his childhood memories. He's remembering this other person's memories. Well, it also goes back to the, the point that, um, that Danny was making where, you know, they, they have this conflict and he sees this beautiful thing and he's trying to help the other, right? He's trying to help Ketterly survive. And that reminds me a lot of kids where they're fighting one moment and punching each other. And then they're like, oh, let's go play. It reminded me of a child and an abusive parent where even if this is somebody who has done terrible to you, you would still want to be with them and, or protect them or view them as something that they're not. Right. Through his you know, childlike innocence. To you. Exactly. And he doesn't understand that you can live with that conflict or dichotomy that this can be somebody that's very important to you, but also somebody who was very damaging to you. It's his view of it is very childlike in nature. Another thing I thought that was a good analogy was during that conflict, you see Ketterly and he's, he's now abandoned the gun. He's trying to chase after his boat. Right. And, yeah. he, and the <laughs> boat keeps sad. swirling God. away and it keeps getting really close to him and then swirling away. And I feel like that is an, an like an analogy of his life of he's yeah. so close to yeah. this knowledge Aww. and every effort he does, the boat just goes further and further away. Because he was too busy with some dumbass attempt to murder somebody else when he could have just grabbed onto the boat in the first place. Yeah, if he would have just uh, grabbed onto the boat. Him. <laughs> if you and just the house o- agreed. Yeah. yeah, he could have just grabbed onto the boat and then been in there and then shot at them. But yeah. no, he had to be all cool and some shoot scientist while the water. doesn't even know order of operations. <laughs> and Paranasi gave him fair warning that he was like really preparing for this flood and the tides merging, and he was like really worried for Sixteen's sake and like his sake. And he's like, you can't be here. What I found was interesting at one point. It was before the other came up with this. Solid plan for sure. But Paranese was like, hey, just FYI, there's going to be this huge tide coming. Like, all of the tides are going to come at once. It's going to be wild. And the other kind of freaked out for a second. He's like, wait, when? And was like, I don't think I can. Like, he got visibly panicked and was like, what do you mean? When is this going to happen? He's like, oh, it's going to happen on Tuesday. He's like, oh, I won't be here. Never mind. I don't care. But for a split second there. He was really afraid of the tides, which means that he has some kind of like fear of the water or something. But then so I don't understand why he still came back to try to shoot the gun at 16 and didn't even get in the boat first if he was so scared. When I read that part, I it made me wonder whether there was a schedule he was keeping. I was like, oh, is he getting closer to something? And this is going to now there's a race against time that he needs to accomplish something before these tides occur. Well, maybe because Arnie was working with was her name, Sarah, the police officer, Sarah Raphael. Yes. Yeah. So maybe he felt rushed because he was like, oh, now Sarah has all this information. The frustration of trying to reach his little rubber raft. I've lived it. <laughs> <laughs> you've been in, you've been in the water and seen the raft. Oh. No, right I've be, I've been in the water and <laughs> I had a. You're talking about soap lake. I am. <laughs> we I had a a a floaty that escaped my grasp and it was a windy day on a lake. It was thirty dollars or forty dollars. It was like pretty expensive. Yeah, so I was kind of like, you let go of it. <laughs> what? And this thing, I just sat there as I watched lasso. this this neon colored donut. <laughs> fly away and no matter how close you got as soon as you got close to it it would just go you push a it little away farther. because of yeah. like you're closer and it pushes a wave to push it away <laughs> but luckily 
some it like went way on the other side of the lake like super far away and then some person just picked it up and brought it back over to us which they're angels so. restored yeah. my belief in the good of humanity yeah, <laughs> yeah that was pretty funny yeah, when I was reading that, I was like, man, I the stress. Everything came. I was like, I hope he wins. I hope Kerry gets whatever it is that he's looking for. <laughs> and he does. He, he finds death. peace. He does find peace ultimately. And quiet. That was uh, probably quiet. my favorite. When he's like, your handsome bones and your head. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. He's like, yeah. Once the birds strip away all the other stuff, then you'll be handsome. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. He does think he's handsome. He says that multiple times. Yeah, like, he does. I wonder why he likes the other. Maybe it's because that, like, I don't know, I guess. That's the only. Think, oh, that like was another thing that, like, love that, for him. that frustration was real. And I don't know if she, like, touched his shoulder or something and he starts weeping. Oh, yeah. yeah that one almost got me to cry. Oh. Yeah. Like, that was a that was a punch to the gut moment in the book for me. Yeah, so. I think. Every, yeah, exactly. The same thing for me where I was like the thought of like suddenly not Being you alone. suddenly realize yeah that for this entire time and as much as maybe it was like almost a visceral reaction that he couldn't control where no matter what like sense of uh no matter how much gaslighting or whatever that was something that was uh that brought him to tears yeah he, yeah. he couldn't help it he said that arriving was something that happened to matthew rose Sorensen, not to me and that the family wasn't his family and that the life wasn't his life and his life was here. And he was just like pretty much cementing his own self in, no, this is where I belong. And then she touches him on the shoulder and it's like he was putting on this brave face of this is where I belong. And then when she touches him, he's like, this is not where I belong mm. is how I read it. Oh, okay. Because he just suddenly was like. I haven't had human contact in six years. Yeah. Like, also, he remembers he was going to say something like so that he was certain that he wasn't. And it had to do with him arriving. And then he suddenly he remembered that he couldn't say that because he wasn't certain that he never arrived there. Yeah. I think that was it. It's like, yeah. So he was basically saying at, at um, when he was talking to her at this particular stage, he's saying, um, so as you see, I have a great many tasks to perform and cannot at the moment, think about leaving these halls because he was talking about returning the dead and all this other stuff. He's, he was making excuses for why he can't leave. He's got so many things to do. And um, she nodded slowly, said, that's okay. There's plenty of time. And she put her hand on his shoulder and he just snapped. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was it was it. basically his, his, his rational mind was trying to go back to reasons why he should stay. Oh, okay. And like, I, I can't leave. I need to stay here in this loving house and I need to be a part of it. I need to return the dead to where they belong. I need to do all the too many tasks. And she's like, it's okay. And he just crushed. It is really scary to know that you have to do something and you're not sure that you're emotionally prepared to do it. And somebody just saying it's okay. Like that is kind of a hard thing to handle, I guess. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, kind of recapping on that point was the slow erosion of his view of the house. The mention by uh, Raphael that these people may have been murder victims where he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where he's tending to them. And, you know, he thinks of them as these noble beings that may have existed before him and what stories they may have come with. And she's like, oh, no, they're just murder victims. And I think he mentions that he's like, I, I just want to think of them as this other thing. So. And how all the statues are just statues. Mm -hmm. He took yeah, great he, offense to that. And he was like, well, this is the pretty much the price of like living with people. They're going to say things that you're not going to agree with or that can like taint your view on the world. Yeah, he did take a lot of offense to the the oh, you've only got statues of mountains and stuff. And he's like, what do you mean old me? You're, you're everything. Like, yeah. <laughs> these will last forever. What are you talking about? These are going to last forever. What are your mountains going to do? They're going to erode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that so was interesting to the, like his analysis of that and his offense to it, where it's like that, that because that's all he knew that was more than good enough for him. Like, it's just this analog of something because he's not experienced that in his own head anyway. Like he doesn't have a memory of that. So, but it could also be like the sense of ownership. Like my siblings can be annoying sometimes and that's fine for me to say that, 
But if you find my siblings annoying, do not say it to me. And <laughs> you do not get to talk shit. Hey, Kelly, got something to tell you. <laughs> you know Keep I it to yourself. Very annoying? <laughs> but it's kind of like you come into my house and talk shit about my friends. Yeah. Because he my had dead, my dead friends. Well, he yeah. had a kind of relationship with them. He would yeah. talk to the Satter statue, like he would like go hang out with the angel, like he really liked the gorilla. Loved yep. the gorilla. <laughs> it gave him comfort. He dreamed about Strength. the gorilla. He felt disrespected by somebody just coming in and being like, "Oh, everything you know is nothing," and that's not what she meant. But I could see how he could take it that way. Yeah, you, know, you come into my house. Literally, you come into my house and you disrespect my statues. What are you doing? <laughs> you lemon smelling bitch. Get out. <laughs> I've had it with you and your sunshine. <laughs> it's interesting after he leaves the house. Like, I think that 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 is where things like the epilogue. When it, he sees at least 70 people. Oh, yeah, I wrote that down, that too. Was he was like, he thinks 70 people is a high improbable number. A high improbable <laughs> 70. number. 70. And she's, like, laughing. She's like, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure there's at least 70 people. Have you the counted world. them yourself? Uh, I have not, but... <laughs> yeah, that was, that was like... Writing I, that in my journal. I laughed out loud. When I, read <laughs> I, that. I was too. like, that is the greatest. <laughs> so, so I think it was kind of interesting when he finally left the house and he's starting to make this realization that he is that he has inside of him Matthew and he is this other person right and so they're kind of at conflict all the time because he also doesn't quite identify with Paranasi anymore yeah right. so now he's awesome. discussing it as if okay so it's me and then there's Paranasi and there's Matthew right and I'm not sure who I am quite but I know I'm not them I started actually thinking about how your name is tied to your identity. I was doing what Einstein would call thought experiments, a.k.a. daydreaming for the rest <laughs> of his dummies. Thought experiments? Yeah, he called them thought experiments because he had a, a job at a patent office and, you know, he didn't have a lab. So I can perform an experiment in my head. Oh, okay. Granted, he probably knew the math and was, uh, I mean... Yeah, we, we all know how that ended. That. <laughs> it changed the world a little bit. But how is your name tied to who you are? Do you want to know what Paranasi means? Okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Ready? Are you sitting down? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, let me lie down on the floor. <laughs> Paranasi was an Italian etcher whose etchings included imaginary prisons. Mm, oh, womp, womp. And so that Paranasi hurts. was basically living in his own imaginary prison. Damn. Holy shit. I thought it was interesting while it, he is kind of wandering around and he does go back to visit the house, but he knows that he can't stay there now. And he doesn't have the same pull as the other guy did where when Paranese brought that other guy, which I name, I forgot, um, that worked at that like city hall or something because he was so obsessed with the house. Ritter. Ritter. Okay. James Ritter. So he brought him back because he knew he was like, yeah, I know you miss this place and it means a lot to you, but he was like begging to stay. And even Piranesi who loves the house so much understands that he can't just leave him there. He's, he can't provide for himself, but also even though Piranesi can provide for himself, he still doesn't stay. But in the real world, he kind of is stuck in the house anyways. Like, he still starts to see. Like I want to take a step back really quick because you made it sound like he was very understanding with James Ritter. But what actually happened was funny and hilarious. And he is showing Ritter, like, oh, here's, here's where you slept under the minotaurs. And here, you know, let's walk around. And Ritter's like, oh, just let me, just leave me here. Let me stay. And... Paranese turns and he's like, are you out of your mind? You can't even feed yourself. I'm not leaving you here. Are you insane? If I ever come back, you can come with me. But no way am I leaving you here. I, yeah. I love the, the he was statement. Judgy, judgy, oh, judgy. Okay. Yeah, he was like, you don't, you don't know how to feed yourself. You never learned. You would die here unless I fed you. And I can't take on that responsibility. Yeah, like, that is funny. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's like, I can't do that. No. Gosh. Out of your gourd? <laughs> but he did promise him that if he goes back for good, he's going to bring him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know what I'd do if I was, uh, if I was 
Ritter, I would start learning how to fish. I would learn how to hunt. I yeah. would learn how, anything I could to be like, look, I can prove myself. I, right, can, I got skills. I, I can make the dried seaweeds. Pure and easy part two or book two. Right? Book it's two. All, like, it's just Ritter trying to earn his way back into the labyrinth. Yeah. <laughs> so he takes he takes Ritter back. But um, I thought what was neat was how Matthew continued to be helped by the house later on it specifically calls it out like Mm. that whenever he thinks of a situation or an issue that he can't quite wrap his head around he goes back through the catalog of statues finds one that is relevant and then figures out the what he thought of it as the meaning when he saw that statue and so oh okay yeah it's like when faced with a person or situation i do not understand my first impulse is still to look for a statue that will enlighten me so he, because he spent all this time contemplating each of the statues um to give him like the message of what he should be doing right exactly um and then when he's out in the park he says as he's looking at this old man the guy's like looking up at the snow and he's like, as I, I realized that I knew him, he's depicted in the northern wall of the 48th Western Hall. So he's seeing these statues, maybe because they are people who are being forgotten or people who have been forgotten or just in general ideas and that are forgotten, but we still know. Hmm. They're not clearly in the halfway point. <laughs> yeah. You know what's kind of interesting that I didn't think of until I was hearing you talk just now? When he's in the labyrinth, he finds comfort and meaning in the birds and what the birds are telling him, which are alive when he's surrounded by death or not death, by non-life. And then when he's out of the labyrinth, he finds comfort and meaning in remembering the statues, which Mm -hmm. are not alive. And he's surrounded by alive things and people and things like that. And I think it's interesting that there's a contrast there. I'm curious as to if he would ever actually go back. Because I looked back at the last... He escapes from the house. And the first day is just people realizing that the other is gone. The second day is people realizing that he's back, that uh, Paranese is back. And then there's two more days and then the book ends. It's not like months. It felt like months when I was reading it. But it's literally less than a week. Oh, okay. The last part the last of the book. Bit. He I mean, spent six years there, like almost to the day. But he adapted so well in less than a week. But he to... also learned how to travel back to the home. He also brought Ritter back. So, I mean, he def- there was definitely, there had to have but been some time. will he go time. back for good? The journal entries are one, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay. Because mm-hmm. okay. he switches to an actual date, like a month mm-hmm. date. Okay. Because, yeah, I kind of skipped that part, I guess. And like in my head, what was going on was that he was out of the house for a while. And then how I interpreted him starting at the very end to see the statues as like the people. He was like, oh, that looks like this statue. That looks like this statue. I just felt like in his brain, he never 100% will leave the house. Like the house will... He, you know, he'll still always be a child of the house. And even though he's not in the house, the world now is the house. He right. frames everything in that frame of reference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So everything he he his entire the depth of his experience is based on anything, everything in that house. So now everything that he experiences, he has to find a comparison from his experiences. Oh, okay. Right? I don't know if that makes any sense, but so for example, one thing that I, th- uh, when you guys were talking about this is English is by far, it may not seem like it, but by far the language that I primarily use. Mm-hmm. But if I'm speaking in Spanish, I need to, in my head, do the translation. It's, I don't know how else to explain it unless you try to learn a language, but you translate it you translate what it is that you're trying to say and then speak it because that's not how my brain is wired. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I see him doing now is he hasn't experienced this long enough. So he doesn't have a frame of reference for how to interact with this new world. So he's translating this world into the house. Exactly. That makes sense. That's interesting. I wouldn't have seen it from that viewpoint. Yeah. So he, he got out of the house on the 26th of November and the book ends on the 1st of December. Oh, okay. And he 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 got to the house on mid November 2012, and he left uh, November 26, 2018. So he spent six years and a couple days there. Oh wow! Okay. So it was only uh, that like 
short amount of time, but short ish. <laughs> yeah. Six years is long. Six years of uh, solitary confinement. That's an eternity. One thing I thought, I mean, this is kind of grim, but I guess maybe I have that sense of humor was <laughs> his shopping list. They were trying to figure out, and by they, I mean the authorities, they were trying to figure out what it, oh, what yeah. had happened. So suddenly Ketterly disappeared. This guy appeared. They're like, well, that can't just be a coincidence. So they're trying to, as detectives do, put together a story and a timeline of what's going on. And they're like, well, this man made some peculiar purchases <laughs> of a rubber raft a sub- and, a uh, and a handgun. <laughs> so he must have gotten on the inflatable raft, gone out to sea somewhere and shot himself. It's like, <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. I was like, that is the most considerate suicide of it. Like, <laughs> seriously, think about how much work it would be to fit. He's like, he's never been on a raft. So here he is. He's like, man, I should have planned this a little bit better because now I got to learn to row. Got to get myself out. And just he self-admittedly was a terrible shot too. Like, yeah. Just imagining these detectives trying to piece this together and be like, but wait a minute, he's never, how would he know how to row against the current of the sea? <laughs> and they're like, he probably didn't get into the raft because details, he didn't know right. actually how to use the raft. So he's yeah. like, oh, I'm screwed anyways. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So did you have any last thoughts at all about the book? So what, what would you rate it? Say oh, rating out of five stars. Oh, I gave it five stars. I gave it five stars. Yeah, yeah I would also give it hundred percent would read again. Yeah. Um, one of my one of my last Cross thoughts. The boards. Yeah. yeah. One of my last thoughts on this one was the last line of this book and the first line of Call of Cthulhu, like the actual Call of Cthulhu story, they reminded me of them of each other. So the last line of this book is the beauty of the house is immeasurable, its kindness infinite. And the first line of Call of Cthulhu is the most merciful thing in the world, I think is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. Mm. You forget what's horrible. Mm. And that's what I was kind of getting at was you, you forget what's horrible, but the, but the house is beautiful. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, for some reason, whenever I was thinking about this book, like as I was reading through it, I'm like, this is a perfect example of Cthulhu insanity. That yeah. is really cool. I'm excited for when we played the Call of Cthulhu D and D. So it's going to be next Thursday. Um, Chris is going to be the DM for just a couple stories, but it's my first time <clears throat> playing or any sort of game with Call of Cthulhu. So that's really cool that you see the correlation there with this book. It's like perfect transition into the game. Yeah. Yeah. The madness, the the insanity, the craziness of other worlds. Yeah, it all translates very well. So let's put Paranasi back on the shelf. Danny, what's next? Our next book that we're reading is A Face Like Glass by Frances Harding. And I was super excited to stumble across this book when I read the synopsis. I was very, very intrigued and interested. <laughs> and there's a couple books that I have read in the past that have to do with masks and hiding one's emotions. And actually, one of my favorite movies of all time um, is called Mirror Mask. And Neil Gaiman was the person who wrote the story. And it's super crazy. It's like very surreal. And the main character falls into this world. She's not wearing a mask. And everyone thinks she's crazy for not wearing a mask. So that's kind of the vibes that I was getting when I read the synopsis for this one. Just like real life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I am so excited to start this book. So Face Like Glass, the cover has this... Almost Alice in Wonderland feeling girl trapped inside of what looks like a Christmas ornament. I'm sure we'll find out what that actually is. <laughs> and the back says, child, thief, madman, spy. Which speaks the truth and which one lies? I cannot wait to start. So please buddy read with us on Goodreads and Instagram at Dog Ear Discourse. And you can view our reading schedule for the year on our website at DogEarDiscourse.com. 